This week we're talking about sampling distributions. So we've talked a lot about distributions so far in the course. And what we've dealt with so far are distributions for individuals. And so what that means is I've got Joe, Bob, Sue, Mary, you know, whatever people. And each of these people contributes a score, right? They took a test and they got a score, right? I take all those scores for all those people. And then I take them and put them into the distribution, right? So each of them is a is a spot, basically, in my distribution. You think about making a histogram or a frequency table. And, and most of the time when we think about distributions, we're thinking about that visual, like a histogram, right? So here, when I'm talking about distributions so far, we've been talking about distributions that are distributions of scores belonging to units of analysis or individuals, right? Um, now we're talking about distributions of something else. These distributions will describe statistics belonging to samples instead of describing scores belonging to people. So that's the real big shift we're going to make here. Instead of talking about single people and their scores, or better said, single units of analyses and their scores, we are now talking about samples and their estimates or statistics. So in the same way that we've talked about why do we care about distributions, why do we care about sampling distributions? Well, if you remember this quote from David Howell that I've put up several times, it reminds us that we can know about the distribution of events, right? Some score, or we can know about the distributions of sample statistics. And so in the same way that if we know about the distribution of scores, we can say whether a score is likely to occur, that is, what is its probability, right? P-values, right? We've gotten into P-values now. So now we're talking not just what is the probability of some score being observed given the distribution for those scores, but now what is the probability of observing some statistic giving the distribution of the statistic, right? So if I get a group of 15 people and I find out that they have an average of some, you know, 74 on a test, and I want to say, well, what's the probability that 15 students would score 74 on this test, right, on average? That would be this context. What I am concerned with here is the performance of a group, a sample, not of an individual. And this sets the foundation for our inferential testing that we'll start talking about here this week as well. And it might seem kind of like, well, why do I, why do I care? But in most contexts, it is groups, samples and populations that we care about. Now we can't normally measure an entire population, so we get a sample. But very rarely do we care about just a given individual and one piece of data because it doesn't provide much information. You know, if you think about, imagine I wanna develop a new drug and I show that my drug made one person better. That doesn't mean much. Like, let's just be honest. I mean, so from that, can we infer it'll make anyone better? Well, we don't know right? Is it a placebo effect? Is it something idiosyncratic to this person? Is it, you know, experimenter effects and expectation? Like, was it something truly biologically important about the drug? If so, what actions did it have? Would it have those actions on others? We don't know. So all we know is the drug helped one person. Now that one person has already been helped. So now the drug is essentially what useless. I mean, it, without more information, it doesn't matter, right? We want to know, for example, if I'm developing some new drug that's supposed to treat depression, I don't want to know if it helped one person who was depressed. That really doesn't matter, right? What I want to know is, will it help people who are depressed? See, that's a population question. People who are depressed, that's my population of interest. And I want to know, will my drug help them? How do I get there? Well, the best way is to get a sample of people with depression, randomly sampled from the population of individuals who are depressed, right? We can apply the treatment to them. Now, we would also want to have a control group, right? We'll talk more about these comparison processes in the coming weeks. But what I want to do then is I want to say, okay, here is what people who are depressed look like. Here's what I would expect, right? And in this week, we're dealing with these known expected values. So say that we know, like, in the population of people who are depressed, the average score on the BEC is, you know, the BEC depression inventory is, say, 31. Okay, so then I get a bunch of people, I give them my drug, they were depressed, I give them the drug, and now they're, the average score in my sample of 100 people is 24. 
did my drug make a significant difference on their depression levels, right? That seven point drop. Well, I have to do some tests. And before I can do that, I'd have to know what is the probability of a sample of 100 people getting an average of 24 on the VEC depression inventory, assuming they belong to the population of people who are depressed, which has a mean of 31. So see, this sets the foundation for making those inferential claims to decide whether a treatment works, to decide whether my new method of teaching is more effective than an old method of teaching when I want to compare students as groups or classes, right? That's a sample question, right? If I want to know if my new method of marketing is more effective, I'm going to look at a bunch of people I've marketed to, not one person. All of these questions in the world where we want to know about our, you know, these effects or these relationships or these patterns all have to do with groups. And when they have to do with groups, they, that means we're dealing with samples. If we're dealing with samples, they're described by statistics. So then to make any kind of inference about the sample, we have to know something about the distribution of sample statistics. And that is the sampling distribution. So the sampling distribution is the distribution of a statistic for all possible samples of size N from the same parent population. So let's break this into its pieces. Number one, the distribution of a statistic. Okay, so it can be any statistic. In this class, we're going to focus on the mean. That's a statistic, right? Remember, statistics are values that describe samples. So there's all kinds of statistics you've learned about in this class, and there are many more. So we have all kinds of statistics we can get the distributions for, and we can say, you know, they have certain properties. In this class, we're going to focus on the sampling distribution of the mean and talk about its properties. Okay, so this is for all possible samples. Now, this often gets people kind of confused. So if I have a classroom and I say that my classroom is my population and it has 30 people in it and say I want samples of size three, notice all samples have to be the same size, right? Size N, which same size. Okay. So I want samples of size three. I have a population of 30. How many possible samples of size three are there in my class? So if you said 10, you're wrong. So I know that seems like such an obvious, but... That is not all possible samples. That is only one configuration of possible samples because all possible samples, remember, involves the concept of sampling with replacement. So that means if I have 30 people in my class, one of the samples of size three, if I'm selecting at random with replacement, would be the same person all three times, right? And then it could be the, that person twice and one other person once. Right. And then it can be that person twice and a different person once. So it's not just like how many groups of, you know, discrete groups of three do I have? No, it's not 30 divided by three equals 10. The number of possible samples is enormous. And in fact, here it would be 30 to the power of three. Right. So that is an enormous number of samples. And in fact, I would be able to get. 27,000 samples of size three from my population of 30 people. So as you can see, the idea of actually getting all these possible samples is pretty cumbersome from the standpoint of doing it as a human. But we can use computers to construct sampling distributions very quickly and effectively. And better yet, because we know the, the computational means by which to obtain them, we've been able to develop, well, what are the characteristics just mathematically that describes the sampling distribution. Because if you remember, a distribution can be described by two values normally, right? So in the case of the distributions we've been talking about, a standard dis normal distribution, a mean and a standard deviation is enough to fully describe it. I don't need any other information. So here with the sampling distribution of the mean, we're gonna have that same kind of process. So to summarize here, what do we have? We have the distribution of a statistic. Here we're focusing on the mean. For all possible samples of size N, that means all the possible samples you could take of the same size from the population. And it has to all come from the same po parent population. So if I'm going to make a sampling distribution of the mean depression in the population of individuals who are depressed, I can't include people who are not depressed in that, right? That doesn't work. That's not the same parent population. 